Hello, hello. Hi. My name is Jerry Pine. Uh, on behalf of Community Information Now, uh, we would like to welcome you to the Somos Neighbors official launch. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, we have a pretty short program here uh, today. Um, you saw that there's lots of stuff outside. Um, we do have a hashtag for this, so if you're going to post anything on social media, it's hashtag Somos210. Uh, so please do that. Um, also, uh, you know, it never fails with these events, right, that um, you try to invite people out. You try to make sure that you remember everyone. Uh, but it's, without fail, you are going to forget someone. And sometimes that person will go, and they will do another town hall debate or something across town on the other side. So we'd officially like to uh, say sorry to Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> um, you know, she seemed busy. We just thought she was busy. I don't know. So it's great to have you all here today. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge a few guests that are here with us today. Uh, Austin Martinez from the Office of U.S. Uh, from the Office of U.S. House Representative Joaquin Castro in the 20th District. Alicia Dorado from the Office of Texas House Representative Ina Mijares, uh, 20th District uh, District 124. Mateo Trevino from the Office of Councilwoman Anna Sandoval, San Antonio City Council District 7. Jennifer Deegan, Vice President of Health Policy and System Strategy at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. And also Zach Light from the Mayor's Office here in San Antonio. And also Bethany Gutierrez from the Office of Texas House Representative Diego Bernat. So a little bit about who we are uh, at Community Information Now for those that aren't familiar. Uh, we're a local nonprofit. We are a, uh, a data intermediary. Uh, what that means uh, is that we take that information and, and put it out to the community. Um, we're housed over at the UT Health Houston School of Public Health in San Antonio over at the Medical Center. Uh, for the last 20 years, San has provided data analysis, training, and tools to help Texas communities make decisions um, that are informed by good data. So we do that through our vision of improving lives and decreasing disparities through democratizing data. Uh, what that means is that we take data we make it accessible and easy to understand for local stakeholders here in our local community. Um, we're also a part of the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which means that um, we're a part of this big partnership across the country, 32 other, uh, other cities that are doing very similar work with data information in their communities. Uh, several of our local partners and funders are also here tonight. Um, we have the Center for Healthcare Services. We have the City of San Antonio represented here as well. The Health Collaborative is here. The Karnkowski Charitable Foundation, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC, uh, SA 2020 this year, the San Antonio Area Foundation, and also the United Way of San Antonio and Bear County. So thank you all for being here as well. So today we're here to celebrate the launch uh, of our latest community data tool, Somos Neighbors. Uh, we'll do a demo here in a little bit uh, so you can see that how, the, how the tool works itself. Uh, but the purpose behind Somos Neighbors is that through data information, we know that neighborhoods are separated by a variety of issues here uh, in Bear County. Uh, and in the case of life expectancy, it's there's, a, there's an 18 year difference depending on where you live in this county, right? So between our highest income neighborhoods and our lowest income neighborhoods, you can have up to an 18 year difference in your average life expectancy depending on where you live. And that's a really big number. It's a really big difference between that, those two communities. So what we're trying to do with Somos Neighbors is to bridge that distance between people's perceptions uh, of our neighborhoods. Um, we want to show that we have a lot in common across the entire county, uh, and we want to show that with the goal uh, that um, we want to show that with the goal of closing that gap with life expectancy here in Bear County. So, what can we do to close that gap, that 18-year gap that is really, really big? And we'll we'll go through that today and talk about it as well. Um, I want to thank a couple of our partners here. So. Uh, I want to thank the Health Collaborative for partnering with us on this project. Um, there's a photo section here where they're helping the volunteers go and take pictures of their neighborhoods. You'll see that in the demo. Uh, I want to thank our funders, the Urban Institute, uh, through funds provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and finally, I want to thank uh, Tanika Lewis Johnson, uh, creator of the Folded Map Project in Chicago. Uh, one of the inspirations for our project here. and. Uh, and she's here to speak with us tonight. So, uh, and now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Polina. Uh, Polina, come. Thank you. Thank you. 
welcome everyone, bienvenidos. Uh, social projects are often inspired by the work that happens in other places, by the leaders and the individuals that see them through. A project by the name of Folded Map, which is a multimedia exhibit in a visual investigation, has been one of the primary uh, inspirations for Somos Neighbors. A project, uh, Folded Map is a project that allows the residents in the city of Chicago to connect through visualization, through photos and data. And our, these projects are often showcased as this folded, uh, folded map throughout the city of Chicago and universities and galleries. I am honored and excited to introduce today the creator of Folded Map, Ms. Tanika Lewis Johnson. She's a philanthropist, a social justice artist, a photographer, an MBA graduate from, the, from National Lewis University, and a recipient of a bachelor's in print journalism and photography from Columbia College in Chicago. Tanika is also the recipient of several awards, including Chicago of the Year in 2017. She was also awarded the Emerging Leading Award by Changing Worlds. In 2019, she was named one of Fields Foundation Leaders for a New Chicago and was appointed as a member of the Cultural Advisory Council of the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events by the Chicago City Council. And most recently, she was recognized by the Chicago Bulls for her contributions to her community. Please join me in welcoming Tanika Lewis Johnson. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I am so proud to be with you today, but I'm just going to take a few seconds to transition into my presentation. <laughs> um, so while she is doing that, I'm going to find a place to put my notes because I don't want to forget what I'm saying. Put it here, so just ignore it. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you all have heard of Chicago's Inglewood neighborhood? Wow, what's the second time? Okay. Um, so I'm not even going to ask you what you've heard, because uh, we don't need to discuss that. But for those who haven't, you can Google it after this presentation. Um, but much like San Antonio, Chicago has a huge life expectancy gap between several neighborhoods, one including Inglewood, the neighborhood that is my home. And a recent report just came out about this life expectancy gap that is not 18 years like you have here, but 30, 30 years. And it's between Inglewood and a neighborhood that's nine miles north called Streeterville. And so today I'm gonna to talk to you not only about this life expectancy gap, but also Folded Map and how this project that I've created has inspired Chicagoans to bridge this gap. So as I talk about Folded Map, I want you to think about how you came to live in your neighborhood. What influenced that decision? Who did you talk to? Because in addition to the life expectancy gap in Chicago between those two neighborhoods, we are also dealing with severe segregation. And so how I came to grow up in Inglewood, which is a predominantly black neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, where most people are told to not go, uh, is because of this woman, Marilyn G. Tenney. She is my grandmother. She came to Chicago in the late 1960s on the tail end of the Great Migration. And I'm assuming most people know what the Great Migration is. And she worked a job at the Social Security office, what most older black people in Chicago called a good government job. She worked that job for seven years and purchased the building that I grew up in, which is the little building behind that red car. That is a Google Street View photo of the block that I grew up on in Inglewood. So for the ones that know about Inglewood, I'm sure it's very different than what you've been told. Inglewood is a huge neighborhood, it's over six square miles, so the violence that you might have heard happens in Inglewood, it is not throughout the entire neighborhood at all. 
And so it was on this block where I met my first friends of life, um, played outside, and we just had a very close-knit block. This is how close-knit the block was. The woman or the girl that used to bully my mother, her son and I are best friends. <laughs> so that's how close this block was. And I was living on this block when I had to commute to the north side for high school. And my commute was about 15 miles. And every day, I noticed a lot of things different about my neighborhood. I would get on the train, and I would look out the window, and this is in 1993, so there was no cell phones, no GPS. If you were a teenager in Chicago on public transit system, you have to know Chicago's grid map, otherwise you'd get lost. So every day on this commute, to make it to school by eight, I would look out the window and I noticed a lot of things were different in my neighborhood than the neighborhood that my high school was in, which was, like I said, 15 miles north. I noticed that my neighborhood had a lot of vacant lots. I didn't understand why. I noticed that my neighborhood had a lot of beauty supply stores and the neighborhood that my high school was in didn't. And I wondered why, because I like beauty supply stores. And then I also wondered, how come my neighborhood only has liquor stores, fast food restaurants, and no cafes? Because after school, I would hang out at cafes around my high school. But the real lesson began through my friendships. Lane Tech High School where I attended is the, has the largest student body in Chicago public school system. It has 4,000 students. Yes. So the black population at Lane Tech High School was about 700. That's a whole school in itself. And so what Lane Tech was able to do in the 90s that it can't do now because of a federal law that doesn't allow you to use race as a criteria, Lane Tech was able to curate the racial demographic of the high school to reflect the demographic, the racial demographic of Chicago. So equal percentage black, white, Latino, and Asian. So it was at high school that I discovered other neighborhoods of Chicago through my friendships. I met my first group of Latino friends who taught me the difference between being Puerto Rican and Mexican, and they said, you better learn the difference. <laughs> I was like, all right, I got it. Then I also met friends who I thought were black like me, but they were from other countries, and they lived on the north side, but they were from countries I had never heard of at the age of 13, like Panama, Belize, and then I also met my friends who were Asian, and they taught me, we are not all Chinese. <laughs> we're Korean, Japanese, and Filipino. Because I, at that young age, thought that Filipinos were Spanish. <laughs> but my Filipino friends taught me why, before history class could. And then I also met friends who were black like me, but from a whole other side of Chicago, called the West Side. And I was like, what is the West Side of Chicago? And they would joke, and they would name streets and say, it's from Cicero to Laramie and Laramie on down. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know it was streets beyond the street called Cicero. And then my friend Steve Zhukiewicz. That was the first Polish name I had ever said out loud. <laughs> but me and Steve were cool. We talked about hip hop and math class and both got bad grades, but that's another story. <laughs> so it was through my friendships at high school that I got to know Chicago's neighborhoods. And I knew that if you were to get to know a neighborhood, it's through your friendships. You can't listen to what you hear on the news. You have to get to know people, and you have to go to their neighborhoods through their eyes. And so as I got older, I reflected on high school, and I realized how segregated Chicago was because of my friendships. What you see here is a map of Chicago segregation. Chicago is on a reticular grid, which means that we have certain points on the north-south side where their actual coordinates, they match. The blue that you see are the neighborhoods that are predominantly black. The orange that you see are the neighborhoods that are predominantly Latino. The green, or yellowish green that you see, 
In the middle and speckled throughout the top are the neighborhoods that are Asian. And the purplish pink that you see are the neighborhoods that are predominantly white. Chicago is the most segregated city in our country. And it has not changed since my grandmother came here. And so as I thought back to my commute to high school, I realized, oh, I wasn't just noticing these changes in neighborhoods. I was actually riding through Chicago segregation. So that's when I started to make the connection between race, investment, and geography. And that's when I realized when you segregate people, it makes it easier to discriminate against them. And these life expectancies that is happening here in San Antonio, existing in Chicago, is concrete evidence of discrimination. So I wanted to really help people understand not only my city, but residential segregation and how, when it, how should I say, how these life expectancies are a direct result of racism from years ago. I wanted people to understand that. So I created this project called Folded Map. And Folded Map is really the embodiment of my life. It is showing how you can still make connections with people despite being segregated. And how it's through those relationships you can learn how to care for people and how to care for people. So what I did, I remembered those streets that were the same, that were in my neighborhood and on the north side. And I photographed those addresses. Like 6900 South Ashland and 6900 North Ashland. These two addresses are 18 miles apart. Same street, 18 miles apart, but they look very different. 6900 South Ashland is an address, a street corner in the neighborhood that I grew up in, still live in Inglewood. And it also includes video of those actual streets. But I'm gonna show you another address pair 6300 South Palina and 6330 North Palina. Again, 18 miles apart. The South Palina address is in Inglewood and those residents who live on that block have to deal with vacant lots and boarded up homes. While 6300 North Palina, all of the homes are lived in, it's beautiful. So beautiful that everyone is proud and a lot of people have the American flag. But as I was taking photos of these addresses that included people's homes, I started meeting the people who live in the homes. And I wish I could tell you that when I started this project, I had planned to have people meet each other, but no, I just wanted to photograph the addresses and not talk to people. But it came a point where people were coming out their house asking, why are you photographing my house? So I had to explain to them. So then I just decided, what well, would you like to meet? each other, and to my surprise, they agreed. So these are people that I will soon call Map Twins. 5400 South Hermitage resident, Maurice, and 6400 North Hermitage residents, John and Paula. Again, 18 miles apart, but they live on the same street. And yes, they are as different as they look. <laughs> but they decided to meet through the project. And I swear, if Maurice, John, and Paula Silverstein can get together to have a conversation, everyone can. <laughs> so I'm going to play for you a clip of the questions that I asked all of the MAP twins, some of which were, how do you describe your neighborhood? The same question that I asked you all, how did you come to live in your neighborhood? And what's missing in your neighborhood? What do you have in your neighborhood that you're proud of? And then, of course, the big money question, how much did your house cost? How much did you pay for rent? Because you can't talk about things like life expectancy, amenities, without talking about the price of a house. So I'm gonna play for you a clip of them answering the question of what's missing in your neighborhood. Let's hope you can hear it. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing a theater. Um, a bowling alley. Um, 
maybe um, some type of center for the youth to kind of go hang out at or have some, some things to do when they get out of school um, or to be able to be exposed to different artistic options to um, just, just kind of give them something to do um, aside kind of like hanging outside and finding different ways or, or getting into trouble. Um, or that, those trouble even being an option because if you have nothing to do, of course, it's like there's trouble rating right over there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> those are some uh, good suggestions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> what are we? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of our needs are, are met here. They yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we could think of something, but uh, <laughs> yeah. so, like I was saying, um, they are. Residents who live on the same street, 18 miles apart. And in Chicago, the zero point is in the middle downtown. So if you were to fold Chicago's map, the neighborhoods that would touch is my neighborhood of Inglewood and the neighborhood that John and Paula live in, which is called Rogers Park, another neighborhood called Andersonville and Edgewater. So now I'm gonna introduce you to another map twin Bridget and Carmen. Carmen is the black woman who lives 6400 South Winchester, and Bridget is right there with her son, Juby, who lives 5600 North Winchester. And I jokingly refer to them as the women of Winchester because when they first met each other, they immediately start complimenting each other on their lipstick, their <laughs> earrings. And so I'm gonna play for you just a short clip of me asking them the question of, what did it mean to meet your map twin? For me, we look different, but we want the same thing. We live different places, but we want the same thing. So it, it gives me a validation that everybody wants the same thing. Most people want the same thing, although we're on different size of the tread. Yeah. I couldn't That's, agree more. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I really enjoyed when you came to our house, but this is by far um way more important to me. Yeah. Um I mean I knew I liked you immediately the minute you oh. opened your door. Um but it's true. I feel yeah. like we've shared so many similarities yeah. as we've sat here, you know, yeah. of wanting the same thing. Um I, I'm grateful because you created an opportunity to just deepen yeah. that sense of of care for other people. And hopefully the project will not just be there. Hopefully someone will see the project and want it to branch out to other areas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, is there anything else you all want to add? I mean, you guys mm -hmm. met each other for the first time. Mm -hmm. We're, We're friends street. now. Exactly. <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're going to hang out. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mind you, this was recorded over a year ago, so I definitely have to share with Carmen that it did branch out. It branched out to you all here through your Somos Neighbors project, and I'm just really delighted to be able to be here with you all and encourage you to participate in this wonderful project and to remind you that bridging the gap can be just as simple as meeting your distant neighbor whether they are down the street, across the expressway, or nine miles away. And just getting to know someone who has a different lived experience than you, you never know where that relationship can go, and you also don't know how it can expand your way of thinking, and more importantly, teach you a different way to care. Because it's our responsibility to learn how to care for each other and figure out a way to fold whatever map we are on so that we can just touch each other's lives. So thank you so much. Uh, can we get another hand for Tanika? That was You'll see 
as we go through this that is a little bit of an inspiration from that. It's a, such a great project and uh, um, we'll do a quick little demo here of, the, of what we put together in order to find matches here in San Antonio um, and, and see how those things are, are, how our neighborhoods are very similar but very uh, different in a lot of ways too. So when we first go to the site, there are demo stations outside um, that you can go and test this on as well if you get done seeing this. Um, but when we first go to the site, uh, we have a design here that was put together by Tribune. This is beautiful. Um, let's see if we can, okay. So when you first come to the site, you see that, that we have an introduction to the project. We do have the, the, the site both in English and Spanish. So when you click over to Spanish, it does change everything over into a Spanish language. Um, so as we, as we scroll down, um, what we start to see is, well, the first, very, the first part of the project is that we went through and did some featured stories where we went out and interviewed people in the, in the neighborhood, uh, in their own neighborhoods across many uh, different neighborhoods throughout the city. We did have three, uh, um, six total featured stories that we put together. Uh, as you click through, you can go through and read as people talk about what brings them uh, joy about their neighborhoods and they talk about how they got there um, and just these really great stories that were put together. Uh, as we scroll down, we get into the part to where you're finding your own match. So you can do this in two ways. You can either put in an address or um, you can also type in landmarks like uh, parks or, that or a school that's in your area. It's basically meant to help have it find where you are at. Uh, so in here I put in 320 Adams, that's a neighborhood, that's an address in this neighborhood here. It, it puts it down in the, in the under your neighborhood, so it's found my neighborhood here. And then we have a match neighborhood that's always in yellow. So the pink is always our neighborhood, yellow is always us. Um, if you don't have an address, you can select a map, you can zoom in and actually just click right on the map and click submit, and that will find the neighborhood that way as well. So just a different way to go and, and find it if you don't have an address or a, a landmark you want to put in. So as we scroll down, what it does is it tells us how our two neighborhoods are similar. Our address and then this neighborhood that we don't know where it is yet, right? So we see that it's very similar in things like occupied housing units, housing cost burden, that's um, spending over 30% of your income in housing costs, um, multi-generation households with grandparent, parent, and child all living in the same household. Our two neighborhoods are very similar in those ways. Um, it also has user uploaded photos. Um, so. What, what this is is when you go in, I'll show this, this part of the functionality a little bit, but um, you can go in and see photos that were uploaded by <coughs> residents of that neighborhood. Um, and you can go through and scroll and see um, what those are in there, uh, what neighborhoods have been included in there. You can also go through and do the same thing for the other neighborhood that's matched there too. So the point is to say that we have a lot of positive photos of like, you know, kids playing in parks, barbecues, those types of things to see how we are very similar across these two neighborhoods. As we scroll down, we have, then we get into the parts where we're also very different. So the neighborhood that I entered in and come into the match neighborhood has an 8.3 year different, 8.3 year difference between our two neighborhoods in life expectancy, right? Um, as we scroll down, we can see other things that make that make us different that are correlated with life expectancy. Things like look at the per capita income on the top, right? This neighborhood here is much higher than my match neighborhood. Um, things like bachelor degree are higher. Uh, um, when we get into uh, health insurance between ages of 18 to 64, dental visits among adults, um, things with uh, sleep patterns, sleeping less than seven hours, right? This is all data information we collect for these neighborhoods, and then we're able to, to do this comparison. And at the end, as we scroll down, we get a map. Um, the shading is of life expectancy in Bear County for neighborhoods, and we can see where our neighborhood is compared to the neighborhood that we match to, right? So now we get a geographic location on where exactly this neighborhood that we've just been going through and, and, and looking at. And we can see where those two differences are. And you can also see the difference in shading between the two life expectancies of those, of those two neighborhoods. Um, we do allow users to go in. Um, you can also, we, we match you to the neighborhood you put in, we match you to the five closest neighborhoods so you can explore further if, you, if you're interested in seeing what other neighborhoods are also similar to you, uh, but also have a much different life expectancy than your own neighborhood. And at the end is close the gap. So what do we do about this, right? Uh, we have three different um, uh, ways that we are putting stuff out there for what you can do. Um, there's things like the county health rankings to learn more, um, essay speak up. Um, we can uh, do like essay 2020 for the type form. Uh, we have essay 2020 for uh, volunteer and donating, sanantonio.gov, bear.org, uh, also uh, vote411. 
So a lot of different resources that you can get now at the bottom. So it's once you once you've done this, what can I do about it? This is where we're putting in those resources. We're able to go through and see what those things are. And so for the for the photo part of it, the user submission, just to quick show that. Um, you can go and click on upload your own photos and what this allows you to do is um, you can go in, you can uh, you get some information around sharing your photos. Uh, again, this is both in English and Spanish as well. You can click on the image, uh, upload image, go through and find your photo that you want to upload. Now you can put it in a description, so what that does is helps us identify what, what that photo is and in case we need any of that information. Um, we do have a photo share policy that you can check out too. And we can click and submit that in. And now what we need to know is where that photo was taken, right? So we need to be able to connect that with the neighborhood so when you're going through and those photos are popping up, we know which neighborhood to attach it to. Uh, so you can either do that um, by typing in, and in this case I'm typing in Chris Park, which is right around the corner from here. Um, so if I took a photo around Chris Park, I would go and locate it there. Um, I can go in and see to make sure that that's in the right spot. I can submit that. Um, and then, uh, we ask for some contact information if you're willing to give it, it's not required, it's optional. But it does, if we need to follow up for anything, if there's something we want to ask about, it just give us the ability to be able to do that. And then we can click submit, and it goes in through a process where we go through and can check them and then start approving. We want to make sure that um, you know, photos are appropriate that are going into it. So they won't go up immediately, but we will go through and, and start approving those so that they are in the neighborhoods. So at this point, we'll move on to the next, next section and hand this back over to Pauline. Hello again. So as part of the demonstration and continuation of it, we would like to now put some human faces to the data that you just saw into some of these neighborhoods. Um, so for this part of the program, I want to introduce Becca McNeil. She's going to lead our resident conversation. She's a native of San Antonio, a journalist and a reporter for the Christian Science Monitor and Texas Tribune, among other communication outlets. We're honored to have her work be part of our Somos Neighbors and to lead this part of the program. With her, we also have two San Antonio residents, Suana Chambers and Mateo Trevino, who have agreed to come forward and share some of their stories and experiences in their neighborhood. So please join me in welcoming Becca, Suana, and Mateo. across various folds in the map. And it's always um, delightful to get people talking about where they live and why they live there and uh, what they love and what they wish was different. And so I thought uh, the, the folks at CI Now asked us to maybe recreate what some of those moments look like. And since I already know these guys, um, they don't know each other. <laughs> um, and so I've already heard um, Mateo's pinch hitting um, for uh, Councilman Sandoval, who participated and facilitated that, and so was familiar with the project. But anyway, I, they are going to have one of those conversations with each other, and I'm uh, going to facilitate it because to spare everyone the awkwardness <laughs> of a first time having these conversations. <laughs> so, um, with that, we're going to lead off with tell me, we're going to just borrow some questions from Tanika's project. What brought you to your neighborhood? Why your first? Why do you live where you live, or where do you live, and then why do you? Live there? I guess I'll go first. Um, so I uh, I live at Cadillac Lofts, which uh, if you're not familiar with the, the downtown apartment uh, scene, it's next to the Central Library, um, and it's <coughs> access to the Riverwalk. How I got there? Um, has anybody driven on Bandera Road? <laughs> I think I just have a really significantly low pressure point or pain point um, for that kind of stuff, and I decided I, I didn't want to drive uh, on that road. I wanted to drive as, as less as a, as least often as possible. Um, 
so I maybe overcorrected really, really severely and came downtown. <laughs> uh, but I love it. I, I'm a five minute walk from the Riverwalk. Um, the library, I can almost pay my fees conveniently at the library. Um, I can bike and walk to work. Can't bus just because of the weird the way the routes are, but uh, great amenities, travel options, um, and uh, a lot less time in my car. I love it. Sounds just like your life, right? <laughs> Tell us about your family. Uh, so I live in the unincorporated part of uh, Converse, Texas. So my address is Converse, but um, San Antonio is also part of the address. Um, neither the SAPD uh, police nor Converse PD come to my house if I ever needed something. Mm -hmm. The sheriff would have to do it. Um, so I moved there because uh, when I graduated uh, from TLU, I started teaching and I got a job in Judson ISD at Metzger Middle School. And I wanted to live in the community where I was working. So I bought a house that was a, about two minutes from uh, my school. It literally was on the same street. Um, and so I taught there uh, for four years I was uh, with Judson and then I moved away. But I moved there because I specifically wanted to see my kids, my students, outside of school. Um, I wanted to know uh, how they were living, and I wanted to make sure that I could connect to them in, in many different ways. Um, the other piece is I wanted to live um, near black people. I am from San Antonio. I grew up on the southeast side. Um, my family's from the east side. Um, and I just feel more comfortable where I'm, where I'm represented. And in San Antonio, we're just not represented, except for in large quantities on the east side, and now on the northeast side, um, where I'm at. So is it still convenient for work? Oh, no, no. I have, <laughs> there is nothing uh, convenient about really where I'm at. Um, I'm going to be in the car at least 25 or 30 minutes, no matter where I'm going. Um, I have to come into San Antonio literally every day. Uh, and so like the school where I work now is 30 minutes. Um, at the doctor's appointments where my kids go, all at least 30 minutes. Um, so it's not convenient in, in the least in terms of making my life easier. Um, but I feel comfortable there and I feel connected there. Is there a lot of comfort and connectivity downtown? I, I don't know if there's comfort. Mm, yeah. Yes. Um, I would describe it though as, as a, there's a lot of serendipity downtown, uh, which I love. A lot of my colleagues uh, work downtown, and so when I am going to and from work, I get to see them uh, entering or exiting the bus or from the bus or occasionally passing me out <coughs> in the car. Uh, and it's, it's these little interactions that are unplanned. They're low stress, they're really just really pleasant uh, with folks. I would say yes, it, there is a lot of that, that comfort. Uh, maybe it's the guy in the leasing office that I see in the morning, or uh, one of the employees of the parks department, the city's parks department, lives on my floor. Um, I get to see, I get to just wave at him sometimes and make a comment about this wind or something or how cold it is all of a sudden. What are the relationships like in your neighborhood? Um, on my street, um, you know, the kids are always outside playing uh, and stuff like that, and so we do support each other. One time I thought I closed my garage, and I totally did not close my garage, um, and so my neighbor came over and like, closed it for me, um, and then when I got home, um, she was like, hey, just wanted you to know, you left your garage open, and I wasn't sure, so I closed it, I'm like, cool, great, because I was gone all day. Um, and so we don't necessarily, we may not like know each other's names, but we see each other. Like we know who live on our street, we know whose children belong at what house, um, when the kids are outside playing, like there's a parent out there, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's my husband, sometimes it's you know, another parent down the street. Um, the parents play basketball with the kids outside, because we live in a cul-de-sac. Um, and so there's a connectedness there, and then everyone just, they use next door, Oh, next door. It was an interesting place. Um, but I would say for all of the craziness that's on next door, um, there are people who do watch each other and, and take care of each other and make sure that um, everything is where it needs to be. I will say I, I like the connectivity you described 
uh, a lot better than mine because uh, I'm trying to think what's the apartment analog to leaving the garage door open. Um, <laughs> this this week actually, I left my laundry in the in I mean I, I got, there's a communal washer dryer space. I went to the to get my laundry out of the dry cleaners. It's like a 10:30 on a Sunday night. I'm ready to go to sleep, and somebody had taken it out for me, very courteously, and then put it on the floor <laughs> uh, behind, kind of behind the dryer, <laughs> which is where all the the gum and hair and the dust collects. Yeah. And I, I kind of think that's that that's sort of you know I saw your garage door open and I keyed your car. <laughs>
that maybe goes through like the entire city and all of our historical landmarks and uh, the Pearl. Uh, there's something like that. Yeah, yeah, there's something like that. Um, so, last thing, if you could change your neighborhood in any way to better meet your needs, what would you change? Don't give, like, this is not an hour long, detailed, like, don't whip out your spreadsheet. But give me your one or two things that you think would take your neighborhood from the neighborhood you chose to the neighborhood of your dreams. Affordable entertainment. Where I'm at, it's a, my experience of walking out of my apartment is I look around and there's a couple of sort of dilapidated houses and a couple of shuttered uh, commercial buildings. And then some like really low key bars that I'm not sure are, are actually still open. And I want to do something fun in the area. Um, my, my choices are really stay home and play board games, which is a great option. Uh, or go to like a nice fancy bar or something and I don't know, spend a lot of money. I had like a, a, middle, a middle option for a board game cafe. Maybe that's a niche. <laughs> 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 the cheap or maybe just a cafe. Maybe just a cafe, right? Yeah. Um, I am, I would love to have like more opportunities for my kids to do things. <laughs> Um, I am in education, and so I'm always trying to find like what, what kind of enrichment activities exist for my children. And every time I'm Googling, you know, swim classes near me or yoga class, whatever, I have to leave my community to do it. Um, there's just not a lot of option for my kids for summer programs, for any of that. Uh, everything's downtown or UTSA or you know, just a place that if I didn't have a reliable vehicle, my children would be able to go there. And I think that's another piece that we, we can't get into. It's like I am on the end of the spectrum where I can get to the things that I want to get to. Um, but a lot of people who live near me cannot. And so there, those options are even worse for them because they are not as, and those things aren't as accessible to them. Um, so I would say more opportunities for my children to be able to do things. Um, and I don't know, I would just say that, you know, for the most part. Um, it's just, I want them to be able to do and have fun and always know that, oh, let's go play on this one. Let's go to this park that's really nice. Um, or let's go take a swim class. I don't have to take it all the way to Stone Hill to take a swim class or things like that. So. Thank you guys. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Chamana, Mateo, and Becca. Um, I do want to point out uh, the things that are on your, the cards that are on your seat. Uh, we do have one that's an overview card that kind of talk, talks about the project. Um, there's another one that's specifically for the photo uploader. It's steps on how to um, take photos of your neighborhood and upload it into the uh, into our site. Um, we have them. There's four of them because there's, there's two of them are in English and two of them are in Spanish. So we made them in both. So no capital. So in closing, uh, we have a long ways to go. Uh, while our neighborhoods are, are separated by um, on many issues, things like income segregation, uh, racial and ethnic seg segregation, ongoing in inequity with local investment, uh, highways and car dependent transportation systems, uh, and of course, life expectancy with up to 18 years, oh, just over 18 years, uh, depending on where you're living in the county. Uh, so there's a lot of work that has to be done. Uh, so let's show that if we can uh, put the gap in life expectancy between our neighborhoods out there and make it information that's available to people through um, sites like this and put that information in people's hands and show how conditions in neighborhoods are systematically different uh, and get that information out to people, it really levels the playing field, right? A lot of people then have access to information that they didn't have access to before. Uh, we want to get people involved that haven't been engaged before. Uh, if you haven't seen uh, Ray Salania's TED Talk, uh, he talks about when he was um, when he was uh, going out door to door and knocking on doors to try to get votes. Um, in that TED talk, he says that uh, of his uh, political advisors were basically saying go to places with high voter turnout, right? And when it comes down to it, uh, he was skipping over a lot of neighborhoods with people that have never been asked to come out and be engaged before, right? And so those are the things we need to think about, like 
if you don't come out and ask somebody uh, to, to be engaged, then will they ever be engaged? So how is anything going to change without getting all communities involved into this? Um, let's connect people with actions that they can take to change neighborhood conditions. Right? So those that learn, act, speak, the thing at the very bottom of the site, those connections and things that we can do in the community to make those changes happen. Um, let's in, so what we want to do is encourage you uh, to integrate these actions into your own community initiatives. If there's something that you're working on, um, we're willing to talk and, and we want to figure out how any of this stuff, if it looked interesting to you, if it's something that you really want to incorporate, let's talk and figure out how we can really make this work in anything that you're working on in the community as well. And then most of all, let's help this community and our leaders uh, see that every neighborhood is in some way unique and beautiful, right? Every neighborhood in this, in this county uh, has its own unique thing, so let's really push that message out there. So I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, please stick around, have conversations with your neighbors. You have name tags on, um, they have the number which tells you, which uh, we just mentioned, but it uh, tells you what your, the life expectancy of your neighborhood is based on from your registration. We've color coded them, so if you try to uh, make a point to go and speak to somebody with a different color than your own, because they live in a different uh, neighborhood than you with a different life expectancy. Um, we encourage you to take photos of your neighborhoods as well. And please take photos out here. You have to make Sam sign into all that. Uh, and please enjoy your evening. Thank you.